I couldn't believe in myself yet, and I rented their level of belief until I got strong enough to possess my own. When I hit him, every breath in my body left, right? My body went completely limp, fell to the ground, blacked out. Exposure sparks inspiration, right? Exposure sparks motivation. The next time it gets tough, uh, the next time you question your purpose, and it gets tough and challenging, just whisper to yourself, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. My name is Inquarius Inky Johnson. A lot of people know me by Inky Johnson, but my real name is Inquarius. Uh, I'm an inspirational speaker, as some would say. I like to just look at it as serving. You know, at one point I was a collegiate football player at the University of Tennessee, and my career ended abruptly making a tackle, almost lost my life, ended up paralyzing my right arm and hand, and that's what led me to the journey that I'm on now. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, east side of Atlanta to be specific, in a neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood. And so born and bred right in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia. So Kirkwood, um, inner city, and at the time when I was growing up in Kirkwood, it was, it was a pretty rough place. Uh, one of the roughest, but just like any other inner city, drugs, gangs, violence, uh, you name it, we had it. Uh, they put a police precinct in our neighborhood, right? And literally put cops out on the street, on bikes, to start riding through the neighborhood to clean the neighborhood up. And they did, you know, they ended up cleaning the neighborhood up. But at the time when I was coming up, it was violence, you know, even in my household, you know, it was drugs, you know, all these things that were transpiring and happening. And that kind of shaped my mindset and the angle and the way that I live my life even until this day. So I, I was born to a mother at 16 years old, a uh, single mother, and she was working a double shift at Wendy's. And at the time she took me back to 125 Warren. And so 125 Warren was a two bedroom home. You know, it's 14 of us living there in that house. And I slept on the floor, you know, with my cousins, with aunts, you know, there's a lot of us. And when I was in that household, you know, my uncles were going in and out of jail, prison, uh, from doing different crimes. And so being there, it kind of affected me in a couple of different ways. You know, I got to see both sides of the spectrum. I got to see my mother get up and go to work. You know, even though she was a single mother, had a hard time raising a son, then she later had my little sister, but she still got up and she went to work and she did it the honest way. And I got to watch my uncles, you know, that I felt were good people at heart, but because of the situation and the circumstances, they felt as if they needed fast money. And so they went out and did certain crimes from drug selling to drug dealing, all type of things. And it landed them in prison, in jail, uncle still in prison until his day. And so I got to see both sides of it and the collateral damage and what it did to family and what it did to children. And so I got to make a choice at an early age because I got to see the dual mentality of both decisions and choices. You know, you come up in a two bedroom home with that many people, it was a lot of love, but at the same time, um, you feel as if that's life, right? Because my, my friends up the street, they were struggling the same way. They lived the same way. They slept on the floor the same way. They didn't have beds, right? And so when I started playing sports, the thing that sports did for me, I think the most important, it wasn't just opportunity. It gave me exposure. And so I remember the first time I went to my coach's house and I was like, man, like his kids got their own room. Like they got their own beds, right? Like they're living. They don't have to rush to the dinner table to try to make sure they rush to get the food because they don't have as many people in the house. Whereas with us, you got 14, 15 people at one time in the house, you got to rush to try to eat sometimes, right? And so when I got to experience a different side of life, I remember coming back and talking to my cousins and I was like, it's a different life out there. And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, it's a different life. Like it's people that don't live like this, right? Like this is not normal. And they couldn't fathom it, right? Until we were with my coach one day and I remember he bought me my first steak. Right. And I came back home and I was like, man, coach bought me a steak, man. I got a steak. Right. And I was so hype. But what it did for me was it made me realize that people didn't have to live like that if they didn't want to. It impacted me and it affected me. Never let a situation or circumstance define your life, no matter what it may be. Right. Because 
you can always look at a situation and think like me, for example, I, I was the first one in my family to go to college, right? In that house, my grandparents had um, 16 children, right? Three of them graduated high school, three. So the value of education was extremely low. And when I came along and I had this dream of going to the NFL, going to college, I could have looked at my situation and said, well, man, more than half of my family didn't even graduate high school. So it's far-fetched. It's not going to happen, right? People even told me when I got to high school. And a cop asked me once, he said, man, what's your dream? I said, I'm going to go Division One. I'm going to go to college. Then I'm going to go to the league. And he's like, you'll probably go to cell block D1. And I was like, man, you're making a mistake. Like, I've never met you a day in my life. And he was like, your family went to this school. Your uncles went to this school. They got an uncle in jail, right? Got an uncle in prison, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, apple don't fall too far from the tree, right? And what he was saying to me was, you'll probably repeat the same pattern that they repeated. You come from the same household, right? And I could have looked at it and made an excuse and said, I'm going to lower my standards to meet and accommodate my household, my experience, my situation, my circumstance. Or I can take my situation and my circumstance and raise my standard and say, I'm going to be an example and I'm going to triumph and I'm going to use my situation and my circumstance as my driving force and my, my fuel, right? And so never allowing a situation or circumstance to define your life and understanding that you got something inside of you that's greater than that situation or the circumstance, but you have to constantly believe it and not only believe it, you have to make decisions and choices every single day to put you a step forward toward what you believe your destiny is. So I attended uh, Alonzo A. Krim High School. And so it's an Atlanta public school. It's over on the east side of town. It was in my neighborhood. And the name of the school was Krim High School, right? Alonzo A. Krim, just to give a little history about it, he was one of the first African American superintendents, right, in Atlanta. And so my school, even though the name of it was Krim High School, had a rich history, people in Atlanta knew it as Crime High, right? Because of the crime, violence, it was the same rep as the neighborhood, pretty much. People don't go to college out of there, right? That was the rep. And so when I got there, people would say to me, hey, Ink, do you want to go to college? I said, yeah, I'm going to college. They say, what school are you going to? I said, I'm going to Krim. I said, people don't go to college really from Krim. Like you got to transfer. People came to talk to my mother, right? Coaches across town at great schools told my mother, hey, we can guarantee you we'll get him a scholarship to play football. Just bring him to our school. My mother said to me, hey, Inky, you want to go to college? Yes, ma'am. Well, you got to go to this school in order to make it happen. People don't really go to college from Krim. I said, yeah, but I think I can do it from Krim. She said, I can't play with your future, which is a mother's position, right? She's supposed to look at the situation and makes what she feels the best decision is for her son. And they transferred me my sophomore year to this school, Tucker High School, great school, sports off the charts, kids going to college, left and right. And I got there and I was so upset, right? And I didn't really go to class. And they would ask me, why? Why aren't you going to class? And I would say, I want to go to college from Krim. They're like, man, you're out of your mind. Like you're at the cream of the crop. Like you want to go back across town? You want to take the harder route and you probably won't even make it from there? And I was like, yeah, because I believe if I make it from there, not only will I make it, I'll open up the door for my family, my friends, and I'll show the people in my community that you can make it from this high school. And so when I went back to that school, I was on a mission, right? Not only just to go to college, I wanted to change the perception of the school. I wanted when people spoke about it, they spoke about it a certain way, right? And so when I went to college, my cousins went to college, right? A couple of my friends ended up going to college. My wife went to college from that same school, right? And so it was a mission that I was on. So I was playing football from the time I was seven years old, but I also played at that high school and uh, we, we weren't very good, right? During my stint, we weren't, right? But prior to me, uh, the school had some pretty good teams, but during my stint, we weren't very good. We had some very athletic guys. Uh, I just don't think at that time, football was the most important, right? Because you had guys with real life situations, right? You had guys, mothers that were dealing with things, whether it was drug addiction, whatever the case may be, guys, fathers that weren't in the household in prison, you know, guys, houses getting broken into. So it was real life issues. When we would come to the lunch table, 
Whereas as most high schools, kids would come to the lunch table, they're talking about goals, dreams, you know, aspirations. When we would come to the lunch table, we we're talking about real life problems, right? We were talking about how such and such is going to eat, right? We were talking about how can he get some clothes on his back, right? What can we do for such and such? We were talking about our situation and we were in high school, we were teenagers, right? Dealing with real life problems. And so football wasn't the most important thing, even though we played it. But to me, it was the most important thing because I felt like this could be the vehicle that I can help my family through. It was a vehicle of expression. And what I mean by that is, I felt as if in my household, I had so much built up. I, w I wouldn't say anger, but it was like, it was misplaced understanding, right? Because I'm coming from this household to where I sleep on the floor, right? With roaches, with rats, I'm not ashamed to admit it, right? And I would go to school and I would compete, I would work. And so when I met a kid that I was competing against, the only thing I felt I had the advantage in my whole life was my work ethic. And I took pride in that, right? I was never the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, never had the most resources, but I had a work ethic. And so for me, when I got on the field, it was like I was free, right? I was free from my household, that two bedroom home with all the people. I was free from sleeping on the floor. Like this was the thing that my identity and I could just be me, but also I could hit people, right? I could tackle people. I can inflict violence, not get in trouble for it. So it was a vehicle of expression that I felt as if, if I do this well, I can get my family in a better situation. If I do this well, I can get my mother off the double shift at Wendy's. If I do this well, I can get my own bed. If I do this well, I can get my grandmother a better living condition. If I do this well, maybe I can stop my uncles from selling drugs, right? And so for me, I viewed it that way. Right. And I firmly believe perspective drives performance. And so my perspective about the game was different. And so therefore it drove my performance to be different. My situation was what it was at a very young age. And so my whole life, I wanted different for my family ever since I was a kid. Right. And my coach took me across town to play ball. And when we'd be riding home, we'd be riding through these neighborhoods. Right. And we would see people in their living condition. Right. And he would be pointing out different houses and people and just telling me about life. You know, he was teaching me and molding me, right? And he was showing me that, hey man, like you don't have to live like that. And when that would be happening, every time I would go back into my community, I was there in the situation, but I was very much cognizant that it was a better life out there if I made the right decisions and right choices. And so it was almost like you come up in this situation of opposition and adversity, that you're in. And then every single day you get to go out and you get to see a different life and you get to be free for a few hours. Then they bring you back into the opposition and adversity. So it's almost like you're taking a test. Then they pull you out of the situation. They take you somewhere. They show you the answers to the test. Then they put you back in a situation and they make you take the test again. And you know the answers, but the opposition and the adversity and the current of it is so strong that for most people, they forget the answers. And for me, I wanted to be laser focused and keep the answers so I can make the right decisions and choices so I can pass what I felt at the time was the ultimate test. So um, me and my wife, we work with homeless uh, downtown Atlanta. And um, in my neighborhood, we see homeless people all the time. Like We had kids that went to school with us that you sleep in abandoned houses that teachers adopted. Like my mentor was my eighth grade math teacher, basketball coach, like him and his wife adopted three kids from Atlanta public school system, right? Because he felt they didn't have anywhere good to go after school. And so you could very much see if you go on one side of town in Atlanta, you could see affluent. If you go on the other side of town, you could see people under bridges for whatever reason, right? And for me, uh, when we do work with homeless now, it's a great teaching tool. Because even at the shelters, you would think when you go to a shelter, the first time we went, we had a group of people with us. And I just wanted to hear their thoughts, right? And most of the circle was like, oh man, you know, people are irresponsible. You know, they're probably doing drugs, right? They probably made some bad choices. And when we got in there and you start talking to people and you meet a mother that say she's there because domestic violence, right? And this is the only place that 
she can go. They can't post pictures on Facebook and the guy can't find her. And she's there and it's a transitional program. She's working. She has an exit date for her and her daughter. You meet a man there, right? That lost his whole family in a house fire, right? And he's trying to get back on his feet, right? And so it's different reasonings. And you got some there that are irresponsible and that may have done drugs, whatever the case may be, right? But I look at it through the lens of who am I to judge, right? If I've been put in a situation to help and to serve, I'm going to help as much as I can. I'm going to serve as much as I can because I feel like that's a part of who I am and that's my character because I've came from a situation to where I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. I came from a place to where I watched my mother scrape up change in dollars to get me a pair of cleats, right? To being in a situation to now I could buy my son, I could buy my daughter cleats and it's not a problem, right? I can even buy their teammates some cleats and it's not a problem. But my perspective about it is different. And I got a level of compassion that a lot of people can't understand. Um, like I firmly believe in life, it's a lot of moments and it's a lot of people that change and impact your life, right? Like I don't believe it's just one moment and you say, this one moment just changed my life. Even though that moment may have, but it's going to be another moment that's going to shape and change your life as well. Like my arm changed my life. My teacher changed my life. But to be more specific, um, when he met me in the eighth grade, the first day he told me my wife at the time, he said, she's going to be your wife one day. Scared the mess out of me. Like, man, this guy has lost his mind, right? But I'll never forget, he drove up in my neighborhood and I was on the corner with one of my uncles. And my uncles at the time, they were drug dealers, right? And I wasn't selling drugs. I was just hanging out. You hung out in the neighborhood on the street. And he pulled up in his truck and he was just like, what are you doing out here? Like, I'm chilling. He's like, no, you didn't hear me. What are you doing out here? I was like, I'm hanging out. He's like, get in the truck. And I got in his truck. He said, point me to your house. I pointed him to my grandmother's house. We pulled up. I get out. And he says to me, Ink, you're better than that. And I was like, I hear you. I was like, but the same corner you just picked me up from, my uncle wear a 2X t-shirt. I said, morning when I come to your class, I'm going to be wearing a 2X t-shirt that he stood on the corner in and probably sold drugs in and did whatever all night, and I'm 135 pounds. So I hear you, right? But to me, those are just words, right? Basically saying to him, I'm coming from a real situation, right? So I hear you talking, but I'm coming from a real situation. And he was like, you think I'm playing? I'll be here in the morning to pick you up. And the next morning he picked me up and he said, here's the deal, man. He said, I'm gonna pick you up. I'm gonna play you in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball every morning and I'm gonna make you recite a proverb until you graduate high school. And I was like, he's just talking. And every single morning he did it. He picked me up, take me to school. He would play me in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball, make me recite a proverb. And this is the moment I knew it was for real. The principal came into the gymnasium and in Atlanta and in you know school systems, most of them worldwide, public schools, you got this thing between the church and the state right, to where they don't want you to bring church religion into the school system, which I get and I understand. And the principal came into the gymnasium and said to him, I heard you've been given inky proverbs, which proverbs out of the Bible. And he said, yes, sir, I have. He said, stop it or I have to fire you. And at the time, my teacher was 23 years old, right? We were his first class of students fresh out of college. And he looked at the principal and he said, well, you're just going to have to fire me because his life is worth it, right? And I'll never forget in that moment saying, if he's willing to put the way that he provides for his family on the line for me, I gotta give him everything I got, right? And I never wanted to let him down. So I would be in the park late when I was a kid and uh, after football practice, because my mother worked a double shift. And so I would stay there and I loved the game. And when she would pull up in the park, you know, most of the kids would be going home and I would be sitting there on the bench and she drove at the time, it was an old Buick Regal and hubcaps off the car, you know, seats torn up, cars all beat up, but we loved it. You know, it was my mother's car. And she would pull up and get out and I would hug her, kiss her. And I would say, mom, if you don't mind, can you sit in the car and turn on your car lights? I gotta do some extra drills. Gotta go to the NFL so you'll never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired, right? And my mother never said to me, Nah, boy, let's go. Get in the car. Let's go home, right? Like, bump that. Not doing that. 
she would always go sit in that car and she would turn on those car lights and I'll be out on the field, I'll be running laps, I'll be doing agility drills, I'll be running sprints, chasing this dream to go to the NFL. And for me, that level of sacrifice was the thing that drove me and still drives me until this day, right? That's why when I competed, it wasn't just about a sport for me, right? Like I looked at competition, I looked at work ethic, I looked at dedication, I looked at commitment, I looked at sacrifice as this is life for me. This isn't about a sport. This is about things that I can extract from the sport and apply it to everyday life to make me somewhat of a decent human being, right? And so when my mother did that for me, that made an impact and an imprint on my soul, right? That I take with me even until this day. The way it worked for me with my scholarship to college, um, so they have a group of athletes and every school has an allotment a number of scholarships that they get every year that they can give to kids all across America. So Tennessee doesn't just have to recruit Tennessee. They can go to Georgia, California. They go to London if they want. They can go anywhere to give a kid a scholarship. So it's the best of the best that they feel fits their scheme, their needs. And so Tennessee came to see me my senior year, and I was a small guy. I was really fast, you know, really tough, gritty kid from, from Atlanta. And uh, they offered me a scholarship, right? And on the spot, I was like, man, I'm coming, I'm going. And for most kids, it's a system and a process to where you take the visit, you know, you go, you see the university, you see what they have to offer, then you make your decision. And so they told me, we want you to come up on a visit. I was like, I don't need it, I'm coming. And I was like, yeah, but we want you to see the city. And so when I first came, I had a host. And so the job of a host is like, they recruit you. They make you love the place. They show you a great time, take you to parties. And my host asked, have you ever been to a sorority party? And I was like, no, nah, I've never been. He's like, we're going tonight, right? And I was like, okay, can you take me back to the Marriott? They had me a room at the Marriott Hotel. He's like, yeah, I'll take you up to get changed. And when we pull up, I just say to him, man, I'll catch you all tomorrow. And he was like, man, are you sick? And I was like, no. He's like, I told you, we got to go to the sorority party, man. It's fun. It gets wild. And I was just like, man, this is the first time I've ever had a room with a bed by myself, right? And it's a king size bed, bro. Like bump that party, I got my own bed. And he's like, you don't got a bed at home? And I was like, no, I was like, I don't got a bed. And he was like, really? I was like, yeah, I don't got a bed, right? So I didn't go to the party. Next morning I got up, I met with my advisor. They said, what's your plan in college? I said, I wanna graduate in three years and go to the NFL so I can help my family. And they said, well, looking at your testing, you didn't just knock it out. I said, yeah, but I really need to help my family. So freshman year, I ended up playing as a true freshman. Uh, not a lot, but I played a lot of special teams and I got in a little bit as a defensive back, right? Which was my primary position. Coming into my sophomore year, I played a lot. I had a really good season. Things were going really well. I had great spring. I was doing well in the classroom. And coming into my junior season, I was as strong as I'd ever been, as fast as I'd ever been. And I was looking like an NFL prospect. So things were going extremely well. And so when you go to college in football, you have to play three years in order to declare for the NFL. Now, basketball, you have to go to college and just play one year. Then you could declare. And so that was going to be my third year that I was about to play complete, then I can declare for the NFL. And so at the beginning of my junior year, my coach came to me and basically said, hey, Inc., man, you're projected draft pick. Like NFL teams scouting you, they love you. All you gotta do is do what you've been doing and you'll get a shot. You'll be an automatic multimillionaire. You could take care of your family. And I was like, awesome, man. And so coming into my junior year, I'm thinking all I have to do is do what I've been doing. I just got to play football. That's easy, right? And I come out the first game we play against California Bears. I execute. I have a great game. We get the victory. And we're going into the second game against Air Force. Tough group, disciplined group. Fourth quarter rolls around, two minutes left. And so usually in two minutes, the game is basically about to be over. And so we're thinking, we make a couple of more stops. I'm thinking if I get the opportunity to hit a guy in the game, make him fumble, get ready for Florida the next week. And so the quarterback drops back, throws it to a guy, he catches it, 
And I go to make the tackle. That's supposed to end the game. And as soon as I hit him, right, something different happened that never happened to me before in my life, right? My body goes completely limp. I fall to the ground. I black out. I just had my anniversary not long ago, September 9th. Um, but it's a special day for me, right? Reflective day. But that exact day, September 9th, 2006, um, it was a day that, you know, I did everything the way I always did it, right? I, I prepare for the game the same way. I listen to the same music. Uh, my pregame routine and ritual was the same. And in that game, when I went to make that tackle, I went at it the way that I always went at a tackle. But for some strange reason, when I hit him, every breath in my body left, right? My body went completely limp, fell to the ground, blacked out. Right When I came to, my teammates were standing over me like, ink it up, let's rock. I was like, I can't. Right? I can't move. There was a shot going through my body. I couldn't feel anything. But me thinking, it's just a stinger, shoulder injury, nothing too serious. Right, And when they get me over to the hospital and they run their test, and then they bring me back into a room, and my mother had just left the room kissing, praying, you know, kiss me on my head, praying, and saying, ink, you'll be fine. Right. And when she walks out, the doctor runs in and says, guys, guys, we got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I remember thinking like, man, like what? Right. I'm, I'm saying to him, like, you can't use another word like man is like use a synonym. Like I'm thinking he's joking. Right. And he's like, no, man, you ruptured this clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. I got to rush you back. Take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. He said, oh, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. He said, you're bleeding internally. And so the next morning I woke up, I was grateful that I was still alive, right? And I think because of the, um, the seriousness of the situation, right? It made me view football in a micro way in terms of I love the game, right? It hurt that my career ended, right? It hurt it right? But I was there. My life was spared. Like if they didn't catch that my artery had busted and I was bleeding internally, I could have went to sleep that night and the next morning, the title on the paper, the newspaper would have been different. It wouldn't have been Inky Johnson suffered possibly career ending injury. It would have been Inky Johnson lost his life last night from a tackle made in the game. And so it made me view it differently. Even though I had a long road a rehabilitation for my arm ahead of me. Uh, my grandmother used to say something to me all the time, and I think it's so true. And she would say to me, Inky, either somebody is in the midst of adversity or just came out of adversity, or it won't be long before they head into adversity. So you need to be prepared either way. And so we all go through adversity, opposition. I think that's the thing that, that makes us all in common as people. Right. No matter if you're from London, Atlanta, Florida, California, New York, like we're all going to go through something at some point or phase in our life. Right. And as cliche as it sounds, when a quote says it's never about what happens to you, it's about how you respond to it. That's very true. Right. But in the same sense, I think what's most important is when we go through something, what's the perspective that we have of it? Right. Because for most people, when you go through something, the person's natural perspective is okay, what did I lose, right? What happened to me? Like, I took a loss, right? People never look at it and say, okay, man, tell me what did you gain, right? Even though I know it hurt, you didn't want to go through it, but look at it in a way to where you can say, what's the lesson in this, right? What would you say life is trying to teach you from dealing with this? And so when I went through it, my perspective was, okay, what can I extract from it to apply to other areas and aspects of my life that I feel can help other people? And I firmly believe the quicker you can shift your perspective from yourself to others when you're in the midst of adversity, the quicker you'll get through it, right? Martin Luther King has a quote that says, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing to help other people? Now, I'm not telling you to not acknowledge your pain. I'm not saying that. I'm not telling you not to say, man, I'm going through this and it's hard. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you go through it, look at it, step back from the picture and say, okay, I'm dealing with this. Nine out of 10 times, there's somebody else that's either dealt with it or they're gonna deal with something similar to this. And if I deal with it in the right way, I can use it to add value to lives of other people. 
The funny thing was, I had never heard of the injury that I suffered. Never heard of it. When I went through it, I met probably 10 guys years after that that had been going through it that I could talk to at different stages and phases in the process and say, hey, man, Inc., how did you deal with this? How did you deal with this? When they told you this, how did you accept that? Right? How did you process that? And I was like, bingo. This is how I got through it. This is how I dealt with it. Right? But I had to shift my perspective from why me to why not me? I think um, we help people in different ways. Right? It's almost like leadership. Right? You find some leaders that are vocal. Right? That can talk. You find other leaders that lead by example. They're not big talkers. Right? They're just the guys you watch. They're going to do their thing. And you can point to him and say, hey, man, you see the way that guy works and does his thing? Follow him. And I think the same for opposition and adversity. You find some people, they can work their way through it, and then they can speak about it and tell people. You got others that deal with it, and they can work their way through it, and you almost have to pry it out of them. And so it's like, for me, with speaking, I never wanted to speak. Never had any interest in it, right? Never said, man, I want to go across the country share my story. I wasn't interested. I wanted to coach. When that fell through, I wanted to work at a rec center in my neighborhood, create leadership curriculums for the kids and just give back to them. And one day I was talking with my buddy and he just made me realize like what you went through just wasn't for you. Right. Basically, like I was being selfish about my situation and my experience. Right. He was like, you're going through it. You got through it. You're dealing with it. But that's not just for you. Like when we go through a situation and circumstance, it's easy to step back and think, man, I just went through this and it's just my experience. I firmly believe when we go through things, it's for us to deal with it, get over it and reach back over the hill to help another person. And a lot of times, like you said, when you're trying to work through it, you think, man, how can I help somebody? And I'm trying to get through it myself. Right. And that's a great perspective. Right. But when you get through it, Right. Maybe you can't help them when you're in the midst of it because you're processing it. But when you get over the hill, I think it's important and I think it's vital that you reach back over the hill and help somebody that may be going through a similar situation. And you can share your values and principles with them because that experience that we go through and we deal with is not just for us. So, um, you know, a lot of athletes and you know, I don't want to speak for all, but a lot of athletes are extremely driven. Right. They're self-starters. Right? Like the guys that I was with at the University of Tennessee, they were all incredible, man, in their own way, because you had the best of the best. You had high performance from everywhere. And so it's like you come from high school and you're the man at this high school, right? And you come from this high school and you're great. And then another guy comes from his high school and he's great. Then they put you all in this pot. And it's like all these great athletes from this great high school or wherever it was, their great city, and you put them together and you say, all right, let's compete. You got the best of the best. And you got some guys that shy away from competition. They're like, I was the man in high school. I shouldn't have to compete, right? You know what I bring to the table. You got other guys that say, I want to compete against the best. I want to go against the best every single day. Not that I'm trying to say I'm the best. I want to go against the best because I know it's going to sharpen me up and make me a better person. And so for the most part, athletes struggle with, I feel, identity. Right. Because you're coming up your whole life and you've been told, man, you're great. Like you're awesome. You're being given things right because of your athletic ability, because of your skill set. And then you get to a point if you don't make it to the NFL or even if you make it to the NBA, Major League Baseball, even if you make it at a certain point is going to end and stop. Right. And people are going to say you're a great player. Right. But the perks are going to stop. They're not going to bow down to you anymore. And a lot of guys, the thing that breaks them is the transition. When you got to go from sports to life. And now your identity and what you did in sports is cool, but it's not so much important anymore. Right. When you get a job in corporate, they expect you to produce and not talk about your stats all day. Right. When you get married to your wife, like you got to learn obedience and compromising as well. Right. But when you're coming from this athletic background, you are used to everybody just praising you and telling you how great you are. And so it's struggling with that identity, but also being extremely talented, being extremely gifted. 
But when you get out of this setting of where people praise you, can you take the things you learned that made you great in that sport and apply them to other areas and aspects of your life to make you just as great as a person? Empty the Bucket, man, was this thing that um, I created just about emptying everything, right? Like everything you got, not living on reserve, right? And I'll tell you where it came from. So when I was a freshman, I had a roommate, right? Extremely talented. He's my guy until this day. Like we're super cool. That's my brother, right? But when we first got our financial aid checks and I got like 2,500, you know, and he got something, I think close to 4,000, right? And we came from similar places, similar backgrounds, similar family experience. And I was like, I'm going to the bank. I'm going to open up me an account. I've never had this much money. And I was like, man, you need to come to the bank, open up your account. And he was like, I'm going to spend this. I'm going to spend all this. And I was like, man, you want to save a little bit of your money? He's like, no, nah, that's the problem. I might not get this much again. And I was like, just come with me to the bank. And so I go to the bank, open up me an account. He opens up an account. He gets this card. And we go to the store and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. Right? He started buying every, give me that, give me those shoes. And we get to the counter and the lady is ringing it up and he gives her the card. And she swipes the card and the card didn't go through. Right. He looks at me and I'm like, man, don't look at me, big spender. You the baller. Right. And he was like, ma'am, can you swipe it again? And she swipes it again and it didn't go through. And he looks at me and I'm like, don't look at me, man. Look at her. And he's like, ma'am, the football office gave me the money. Can you please try it again? I know I got the money. And when she swiped it, it didn't go through. And as she was handing him the card back, she said to him, sir, you probably have the money, but you didn't pull the strip off to activate it. She was like, you never activated the card, right? And I was like, for most people, man, you could be great, but you haven't even pulled a strip off to activate it, right? Like you can be great, but you're living on reserve, right? You didn't, you didn't empty the bucket, right? You didn't give everything you had to every aspect of your life. Like for most people, they're great professionally, but they end up becoming a public success and behind closed doors, they're private failure. Not because they don't have the talent or the skill set, they don't have the character, right? That they can apply it and be consistent in every aspect of their life and empty out everything they got to everything, right? Now, one would say, okay, well, when do you tone it back, right? You find pockets to turn it back, turn it back, right? Of course, you don't just give everything you got all the time, right? You get to a point where you learn to be efficient and effective in every aspect of your life. And for most people, it's not a problem of skill set. It's a problem of character. And empty the bucket is having the right character to be consistent and empty out everything you got in every aspect of your life. I think, uh, man, it's, it's funny. I think the true measure of wealth is, uh, is happiness, right? Like I really do. And that's not saying that I'm against money. I'm not against that at all. Because you gotta gotta work hard, make your money, take care of your family, and be able to bless people. But I think it's a lot of people with so-called wealth, and they don't have joy and they don't have happiness, right? And I feel like joy, happiness, is peace, and peace is the most important things we can possess, right? And for most people, their material possessions they feel are the most important. For me, when you got joy, when you got peace, when you got happiness, I think that's true wealth because you can't put a price on that. Like for me, people can't understand. A guy asked me just yesterday, what do you think about stem cell? Why don't you go over to London or one of these places somewhere and try to get stem cell for your arm? And I was like, I got peace. And he's like, what does that mean? I was like, I'm good with my situation, right? Like I'm, I'm wealthy because of that. I got something that you can't, put a price on, right? You can't price out my joy. You can't price out my happiness. You can't price out my peace. Now, if I measure wealth by money, money is a number. Numbers never end, right? So you never catch it. Numbers never stop. If your happiness is predicated upon a number, if you're being wealthy, it's predicated upon a number, you'll get it. Then it's like, okay, I got to set it a little bit higher. The number will never end. And so therefore, you'll never be wealthy enough.
if I get to the end of my life um, and, you know, I'm an old guy at the time and I'm sitting back in a rocking chair on my porch with my wife and got a head full of gray hair and our kids come up and we're just chilling out and I've accomplished a lot and my wife is sitting there and my son and my daughter comes up and they say to me, like, Dad, man, you accomplished a lot. Like, you're a great player. You've done well speaking, but we feel like you're a terrible father, right? Like, what would it be worth for me to accomplish, gain, give them certain things, and suck as a father, right? My wife got me aside and said, hey, man, you've done really well in speaking and, like, your athletic ability, but you're a terrible husband. What would it be worth? Right. And so for me, I feel like the greatest gift I could ever give to my children is showing them that I honor, love, respect and admire their mother. Right. The greatest thing that I could ever give to my children also is not something that I can give to them. It's the things that I will leave in them, the principles, the values, the guide, how you treat people, how you live your life, how you make decisions and choices. And so family is something that's very important to me, right? To be honest, I don't think a person, you know how a lot of times we consider someone to be great, right? That guy's great, right? Like for me, the true measure of greatness is if you can reproduce it in your family, like with your children, right? If one day your children come up and they're great, not great in athletic ability, no, great people, right? Like when they come up, like we saw a young man yesterday and I went to speak at a school, right? And I was just talking to some kids, basically because a young man reached out, had the courage to reach out and ask me, could I come and talk to his junior class? And I was like, no problem, man, I'll do it for you. And after I met him, his parents came and I said, man, his dad and his mother gotta be proud, right? Because he's a great young man. To me, that speaks volumes of the parents that they are. And so for me, that's what I want somebody to say about my son, my daughter, in my family one day. Man, it's, it's so tough, um, you know, because I remember when I was young and I didn't have my father, right, in the household. And we got, we became cool. And um, I remember I used to live my life and I had like, it was, it was like a resentment toward him, right? Because I couldn't understand why he wasn't there early on. Like I just couldn't understand it, right? And like when I would be home and we would experience certain things and me and my cousins would be asleep on the floor, right? And there were certain questions and things at times that I wanted to ask my father and because he wasn't in the household, I couldn't ask him. So it created a resentment until one day I just asked. We were together and, you know, I just asked like, man, what happened? You know, and he just shared with me what happened, right? Like I was young, your mother was young. Right. I ended up losing my mother. Right. And I was just scared. Right. And when he told me this situation, I could understand it. Right. And for most people, it's like forgiveness is the hardest thing in the world. And when you see a son, when you see him coming up with his mother or you see a father that's not present, a lot of times for me, I think now, man, what's that situation? And I want to understand it. Right, because I firmly believe, as tough as the situation is, my teacher said this to me. My teacher, who's my mentor, my eighth grade teacher, he said to me one day when I was in the eighth grade, because I was we was talking about fatherhood and stuff like that, and some of the, my friends they were talking about their fathers. We were just having a man conversation, and one of my friends said, "Like, man, my father don't care about me. He don't want me. Right? Like, I'm in the world. I don't see him. Right?" And my teacher said to him, son, I don't think any man brings a kid into this world and don't think about him and don't love him and don't want him. And the kid was like, no, man, like that's wrong. Right. And he was like, I'm, I'm a man. I'm a father. I'm a husband. Right. And when he said it at the time, I was young and I was like, I don't know. But now that I'm a father. Right. I got two kids. or I got three little sisters. Right. And it's this thing inside of me that that makes me think like he was he was it was true. 
It was real. But situations and circumstances happen sometimes that we can't understand. And it leaves a mother in a household or sometimes it leaves a father to be a single father, right? And when that happens, I think the village is important. It's like me. I got I got a level of accountability and responsibility with my son, right? If my son plays on a team, right, and his kids on that team, that their fathers are not present, I feel like I have a responsibility and obligation not to be their father, right, but to fill a void to be a positive male figure in that kid's life as much as possible and not just look at the kid and see him drowning and just be like, that's not my kid. I'll just let him drown. Right? No, he's very much so my kid, right? Because God has put me here to be present in this kid's presence. So I'm going to help him, right? And so it's just becoming a village around that mother or around that father to assist as much as possible to help that kid be shaped and molded in the right way with principles. I think, um, man, I think the greatest gifts in life and is belief and exposure, right? Because a lot of times, for me personally, the reason I say that is, there was a lot of moments in my life to where it was people that saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. And they believed in me in a way that I couldn't believe in myself yet. And I rented their level of belief until I got strong enough to possess my own, right? It's like when you're young and they see you, and it's like even when you start out doing what you're doing, you could be talented, right? And somebody older than you or more experienced than you can see you and know like, oh man, if he did this, or if he does this, man, he could be great, right? And they can come to you and say, hey kid, man, you got something. Like you could be great, right? Like my teachers and my coaches, when they came to me and they was like, son, I'm telling you, like you can go to college, man. Like you really, I know you're talking about it, but your circumstances are saying different. I think you can do it, right? And when they said it, I'm like, oh, I can, I can do it. Like I can make it happen. Because they're believing in me making it happen, I think I can do it. So I think belief, and the reason I say exposure is because, like, I think when you show people things, that's powerful. I think exposure sparks inspiration, right? Exposure sparks motivation. Like, when I was coming up in that two-bedroom house with all those people, and I went to the other side of town with my coach, and he was like, no, people don't, you don't have to live like that, ain't? You can live a normal life right? It changed my whole mindset. And my mindset can never go back to the way that it once was because I have been exposed to something different, to something new. And so I think belief and exposure are two of the most powerful things that can happen to a person. The reason that um, I think belief is important is because like when you're young or when you do something and you're a novice, right? And you start out doing it and you might think you can do something with it or you might not. You might do it and it's being driven by your passion. And then somebody comes along that's a little bit older or even more experienced and they can see it in a way that you can't see it, right? And so I think it's important with belief because if a person believes in you in a way that you don't believe in yourself, you can rent that person's belief until you get strong enough to possess your own, right? And you use that person's belief to fuel you every single day, right? Because you can have a level of belief with what you're doing, but you can go back to a certain set of circumstances that tell you, nah, it's not going to happen. And so you rent that person's belief until you get strong enough to possess your own. I think, um, I think having a purpose is that thing that, that makes us tick, that gets us up every day and gets us over the hump of opposition and adversity. And the reason that I champion adversity and opposition is because I think for the most part in life, people pretty much know what to do when things go right, right? Like when things go right, they know how to feel, they know how to act, how to react, but it's when that opposition and that adversity comes and it creates a level of misunderstanding, right? Now the vision is blurred. Now you don't have clarity about what you're supposed to do. Now you question if your existence matters. And I think when you have a purpose, it's powerful because in the midst of the opposition, it makes you realize that you've been put here for a certain reason. And so me, once I tapped into my purpose of once I thought it was football, right? But when I started speaking, I'll never forget the day I got the exact same feeling backstage that I used to get 
before I ran out on the field to play football. And that's when I knew, like, this is my purpose. This is what I've been put here to do. And so the opposition, adversity, the challenges, is just a part of the process. It's going to make me a better person. But my purpose, I can't let anything stop or detour me from tapping into that every single day. Because the key with purpose is, I firmly believe every person's purpose is tied to somebody else's purpose and destiny. And so your purpose, my purpose, is tied to somebody else. Like when I speak, when I do what I do, like people say, oh, man, man I really needed to hear that, right? That helped me do this. That helped get me through this. That helped me with this. That's my purpose being tied to other people's purpose, destiny, beliefs, and dreams. That's the power and magic of purpose, right? I don't think it can be a purpose without being tied to other people's purpose, destiny, dreams, and aspirations, right? I think that's the power in it, but realizing it is another thing. That thing that not only feels right, that thing that when you do it, it impacts the lives of other people. Like prime example, you guys in, in the videos that you create, right? The platform that you've been blessed with, that helps people. Right. That serves as a blessing of people. Right. That gets people through challenges. Right. And it's a video. Right. But everybody can't do the video the way that you guys do the video. Everybody doesn't feel as if that's their purpose to do these videos, put them out to let them impact the world. Everybody don't view it that way. And so I think when you look at it and you assess the situation or whatever you're doing, I think on the other end of purpose, you have to look at it and count the cost and say, is what I'm doing helping people, right? And I think when you view it that way and you can see it visibly, I think then you know you're in line with your purpose, right? If I was just speaking to speak and it didn't touch anybody or people would hear me and be like, oh, okay, that's not my purpose. But when I speak and somebody say, hey man, that helped me get through this, that got me through this, I got my mother over cancer, that helped my son get through this. That helped me with my marriage. I'm in line with my purpose. It's humbling, man. It's humbling. Um, because when you think about it, nobody has to say to me, like, thank you. Nobody has to say, man, that video really helped me and my relationship with my son. Nobody has to say to me, like, man, I showed this to my staff. Like, they don't have to do that. Like, people are grown. Like, you guys didn't have to come down and do this. You didn't, right? You can stay in your pocket, do what you do, create great videos, help people. You never had to say, hey, Ink, man, we want to do this, put out a project, be pretty cool. You don't have to do that. And so for me, it's being aware that what I'm doing is a lot greater than me. It's bigger than me. You remove the ego from it. You remove the eye from it. You remove the desire from it, right? And then you're left with your purpose and what you feel you've been put here to do. And so when people say, hey, man, I really appreciate what you do, if you feel as if that's your purpose and your reason for living and why you do what you do, I think you accept it in a different way, right? And so for me, I like to call it just destiny moments, right? When I bump into somebody in the airport and they say, hey, man, I really need to talk to you about what you said when I'm like, thank you, right? I bump into somebody out in the street, man, I really need to, I'm like, man, thank you. Right. Because I realize what I do is bigger than me. Right. If I was just an ego driven, that thought, oh, man, I'm, what I do, I'm just bad. Right. You don't appreciate what people say. You don't value it. You don't respect it. You just look at things in terms of superficial, materialistic and how it makes you feel. Right. But I think when it's your purpose, you think about how does it make other people feel? <laughs> I wouldn't change a thing. Right. And um, the reason that I wouldn't change it, you know, a lot of times I think people think that the reason I say I wouldn't change it, it has just something to do with me. Right. And it does to a certain extent because my perspective change. Right. The man that I now am, I think, is as a result of my injury and the things that I've been through. Right. The whole process of it. Right. From rehabilitation to accepting the injury to learning how to do things with my left hand, the whole process of it. But the reason I wouldn't change it is the impact that I saw it have in the lives of people that I love, that I respect, and people all over the world. 
right? Like that lets me know that this was a part of my destiny. This was divine appointment, right? Because I saw people around me visibly change, right? Because I was able to remove myself from the situation and not just sit there and be like, why did this have to happen to me? Why me? Not that anything is wrong with that, right? If a person has to question it, question it. Do what you got to do, man, to get you through your process. But in terms of me dealing with it, right? When I was able to remove myself from the situation, step back and started to view how what I was going through affected other people for the better, right? Their lives improved as a result of it. And so if I go back and say, I'll change it, I would have to be thinking only about me and my selfish ambition of making it to the NFL. And the reason that I wouldn't change it is because of not only the impact that this had on my life, the reason I wouldn't change it is because of the impact that it had on people's lives that were interconnected to me, both directly and indirectly. But I just want to, uh, I just want to be a great person, man. Like I want to, when the clock stops on my life, when it's all said and done, like I was telling my kids, like the best thing that I could ever give to them, right? As just as a father, as the leader of my household, the best thing that I could ever give to them is a good name, right? That's the most valuable thing that I could give to my family, right? Is a good name, right? That people know we do things the right way. We treat people the right way and situations and circumstances and people don't affect or don't alter that, right? When it's all said and done, when people speak about me, they don't have to lie on my behalf, right? They don't have to say, oh, he's a good person, but in their heart, they don't believe that to be true, right? Not saying that everybody is going to like me. Everybody doesn't like in everybody. Like it just doesn't happen that way. But for those that know me and my character, right? When it's all said and done, will I have said more than I've done? Because for most people, it's a lot of talk, right? But I want to do more, right? I want to be a great person. I want to make my impact on the world, right? I want to go down in the character hall of fame, right? The character, like that was a man of supreme character. You judge the character of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the character of a person by where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. Man, the biggest inspiration. Uh, my mother, yeah, my mother and my grandmother, yeah, I have to put them two together, yeah. My boy, The Rock, man, The Rock is my guy, right? The Rock shows me a lot of love, um, man, he, he supports my message, uh, he, he's posted uh, my messages before, uh, he sent me messages before, like lengthy messages about something that I've said, how it impacted him. And uh, just following him, man, the guy's an animal, right? He's an inspiration, man. You see the way he works, but not only the way that he works, you see the way that he treat he treats people and the way that he handles himself. And so I would say Dwayne The Rock Johnson, it's my guy, man. His, um, his agent, a um, guy by the name of Brad Slater at the time, reached out. And uh, when he reached out, I didn't think it was serious. I was like, you know, he reached out and I think I might have hung up the phone on him at first because I was like, man, it's probably my boy he's trying to prank me. Right. And he hit back and he was like, no, man, this is really me. Like me, I, I represent like Dwayne Rock Johnson, like Dwayne loves your stuff. And I was like, whatever, man, this guy's bluffing. And sure enough, he's the real deal. Right. And the rock reached out and there was. It was all she wrote from there, man. But that was that was a big day, you know, for me. And then that same day he posted something. And that's when I knew, like, oh, it's real deal. And everybody's reaching out, like, you saw the rock, post your stuff. And I was like, that's crazy. But ever since then, it's been consistent, man. And, you know, we reach out back and forth. And he's awesome, man. My first paid speaking engagement, um, the check at the time was uh $2,500. And I spoke for like a, a high school graduation. And at the time, I didn't really negotiate a fee. I just agreed to do it. And this was like 13 years ago. And I spoke and the guy, you know, he gave me the envelope. When I got in the car, I was driving home. And I stopped at a gas station. I opened the envelope. 
It was like $2,500. And I called my wife. And I was like, babe, I just got paid $2,500 to speak. And she was like, that's awesome, right? But that was that was um, my favorite career moment. You know, and I, since then, I've had some great career moments, like speaking Chick-fil-A, Coca-Cola, NFL teams, you know, NBA teams. But that first moment, you know, when I did it, when I got compensated for it, I impacted the lives of some young kids. It made me realize it was real. This too shall pass, right? And the reason I would say that is, um, like I said, I champion adversity, right? We know what to do when things go right. But the next time it gets tough, uh, the next time you question your purpose, the next time you question your existence, um, your mission, if you're supposed to be doing what you're doing, and it gets tough and challenging, just whisper to yourself, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. Hey, how you doing, guys? Inky Johnson here. Just got done, man, doing an interview with my guys, the Mulligan Brothers. We had a great time. I appreciate their platform and what they do. Most importantly, I respect and I admire it. Take care. Peace.